If you're anything like me, you've had one of these sitting on your shelf for a while and you're not quite sure what to do with it, well I'm here to show you what to do. I'm Mr. Vestek and I'm your Raspberry Pi Ally. Hey everybody, welcome to what is going to be one of the first in a series of tutorial videos for the Raspberry Pi. If you're anything like me, it's been sitting on a shelf for a while and you've had this cool device, you're not really too sure what to do with it. So, I'm here to change that. I'm going to try and make it as simple to understand as possible with barely any Linux knowledge required. I'm Mr. Vestek and I'm your Raspberry Pi ally. In the first of these videos, what we're going to do is we're going to install RetroPie on the Raspberry Pi. This installs a couple of different game emulators um, so that you can kind of relive a retro gaming experience. The Raspberry Pi is not an overly powerful device. It's mainly used for teaching people how to program, but there are you know other things that you can do with it as you will see in the upcoming videos. It'll be pretty limited in the devices that you can emulate in the sense that um, you'll be mainly talking the, the older consoles with 2D graphics. So you can emulate up to an original PlayStation but you're going to be talking about the Sega Mega Drive slash Genesis depending on where in the world you're tuned in from and the Super Nintendo, the Nintendo, the Amiga, a couple of different systems like that. So. In order to get going, first of all, with Raspberry Pi, you're going to need the following. A Raspberry Pi. You'd think that would be quite obvious, but you never know. Some people might miss that part. A HDMI cable. An SD card that's at least 8 gigs. Because uh, you do want plenty of space for storing your ROMs in there. And you will also need a USB micro B power supply. Ideally, you want one um, with at least a thousand milliamps because we will be powering a couple of things off this in the future where you will need slightly more power. For the Retro Pi, not so much. You're only powering a USB controller and a keyboard, so any kind of modern smartphone charger will do. But ideally, you want to get something like this. You can pick these up pretty cheap enough on eBay. Um, for a couple of euro, pounds or dollars, depending on where you are. Okay, so before we go connecting the Raspberry Pi up to your TV, you're going to need to do a couple of things in order to prepare the SD card for booting the Raspberry Pi. So I'm going to try and make it as easy to follow as possible and with the least amount of Linux knowledge required. So, here goes. Okay, so first of all, we're going to want to open our web browser. And once the web browser opens up, we're going to navigate to the Pet Rock blog website. It's blog.petrockblog.com forward slash RetroPie. I'll put a link to that in the description below the video. Now if I scroll down here just a little bit, you'll see that you have a couple of different downloads available. I'm gonna show you pretty much each major way that you can get the RetroPie download. So first of all, we're gonna try the Google Drive link. I'll just show you how that works. It's straightforward enough really. You'll see the following page and down the left hand corner here you'll see a big kind of orange download button so we'll just click on that. You'll be brought to the following page on Google Drive and just click download. It's as simple as that. Click download anyway and there you go. It will start to download and you'll see it come down. It does take a little while depending on your download speed. Obviously I'm not going to show you the full thing right here. We're going to fast forward through it right now. So this time, we're going to be grabbing the same download and we're going to be doing it through a torrent client instead. So it's very similar to any other torrent you may have downloaded in the past. You just download the torrent file here and up pops your favorite torrent client. In this case, I'm using MooTorrent. Now it might be a good idea to tell it to download to a specific folder that you've created somewhere on your hard drive. Uh, you can see me doing that here. The reason for that being is that you kind of want to keep all of these files together just to keep it tidy so that you don't get confused. In a moment we will be using an SD card flasher so it's always good to have all of the downloads and tools in the one place. Now you can see that that torrent is starting the download process just there but don't worry I'm not going to make you sit through that download process. We're going to skip ahead now to the next part. 
Once you have the file downloaded, if you have a program like 7-Zip installed, you can right click on the zip file and select extract to folder name and it will extract all of the files that are in that zip image into a folder that you can then use. As you can see here, it is a rather large file, so it is a lengthy process. However, if we click our fingers like this, we can speed it up. Now we'll want to open our web browser again. This time I'm going to use Google Chrome just to be a little bit different. And we're going to go to the Win32 Image Writer website, uh, which is on Launchpad. I'm going to paste a link to that below in the description bar down at the bottom of this video. So when you do get to the Image Writer for Windows website, you'll want to scroll down to where it says SourceForge Project, as this is where you can download the main file from SourceForge. So in the middle of the page, you'll see a green download button. You'll want to click on that and it will download the setup files for Win32 Disk Imager, which is what we are doing here. It does take a couple of seconds to count down while it selects the best mirror for the best speed possible, but it will download there, as you can see, down the bottom left-hand corner. When that's finished downloading, you're either going to want to click on it, like so, or select Show in Folder. They both do the same thing, which will open up the zip file straight away, which you'll then want to extract to the same place that you have the RetroPie image on your hard drive. As I mentioned earlier, you do want to have everything in the same place just to make things a little bit tidier. As you can see here, I'm just putting it in its own folder inside the RetroPie folder. And that will extract. It won't take too much time at all. Once you've extracted the Win32 disk imager into its own folder, you can go ahead and double click on it there to start it up. You're just going to want to double click on the win32 disk imager.exe. And when it has loaded up there, just click that little blue folder icon to point it towards the RetroPie disk image that you downloaded previously. You'll just see me doing that here. Going to the W drive, going to RetroPie, RetroPie image, and there you go. There's the .img file that we downloaded earlier. And then we simply want to click write. It's going to ask you which drive letter you want to save it to. Now that's very important. You do not want to overwrite the wrong drive. And I should also mention that it is good practice to format the SD card before you do this to FAT32, just so that it is empty and that it is the right file format. The write process does take quite a long time, I have to say. On my system here, it took at least three or four minutes. I'm not going to make you sit through this. We're going to skip ahead now. But once this is done, and you'll see this fast forwarding now as we speak, once this is done, you're pretty much ready to put the SD card into the Raspberry Pi and connect it up to your TV. So that's what we're going to do now. Before we connect it up to the TV, this is a very vital, important step. Do not, under any circumstances, forget to connect this SD card in here, because otherwise you'll plug it in and turn it on and nothing will happen. One thing I should have mentioned is that when you plug in the power to the Raspberry Pi, it will power up straight away. It does not have an on or off switch. It just powers up pretty much straight away. So after it's powered up for the first time, you'll be presented with a screen like this. You will be asked to configure various different buttons. Now, I do not have a USB controller set up as of yet. That's going to be in the next video. I have to set that up. It's going to be in the next video. So I am in the middle of configuring it with my keyboard at the moment. Now, bear in mind, this does seem to take quite a while and um, it goes to showing no video for a while before it actually asks you for the next uh, configuration option. I don't know if that's, just, if that's just a HDMI thing or whatever, I don't have it connected via composite and um, we shall see. Another thing that I should also note as well is that when you do have it connected, make sure to connect the Ethernet port of the Raspberry Pi to your router because that will become important in the next bit of the setup. Now you see here it does take a while between options and now it's actually asking me what button I want to set up as the menu button. Let's say it's uh, number one. I can imagine this is going to take a while, so I'm just going to skip ahead. That certainly took a while, maybe a little bit longer than it should have done. Um, after that, you're pretty much brought a screen that shows you a selection of different systems that you can boot. Um, I've selected the Apple II, and one of the freeware games that comes with it is Cave Story. Well, I don't know if you can see all the kind of pixelation that's around my screen. I'm starting to think that the reason that my video doesn't really work properly or that it keeps cutting out is because of my HDMI switcher. Maybe 
the Raspberry Pi along with some other devices that I have don't like switchers so I'm going to switch over now to a dedicated HDMI channel and see if it makes any difference whatsoever. Booyah! Well, that's actually made a world of difference. So, we've both learned something today. <laughs> the Raspberry Pi does not like HDMI switchers. So there are a couple of different freewares that come as part of this image as far as I can see. You've got a couple of different emulators that you can choose from. Uh, you've got DOS emulation, which I assume is what Duke Nukem was all about there. This is actually much better. It's not stalling at all on me now, which is fantastic. I wish I'd have known that uh, just a little bit while ago. So, so far it seems that I only have two systems on it really. The Apple II and uh, DOS games, basically. We'll have a quick go of Duke Nukem 3D, just to see how it performs. I'm sure I'm going to need my mouse for this. This is going to bring me back. This is going to bring me back. Let's just turn the sound up for this a little bit. Yeah, I remember that alright. New game. New game, Duke. New game. How do you melt down? Let's rock. Bit of flickering going on there, but oh. Check this out. Oh, this takes me. Why is it not with the mouse? It's not picking up my mouse very well for some reason. Hmm. Yeah, it doesn't seem to be picking up the mouse there, but that's probably a configuration thing that I've done. But check that out. Duke Nukem 3D on your Raspberry Pi using RetroPi. Quick game. Uh, yes. Yes, yes, yes. I know, it's trial version. Blah, blah, blah. We don't want to pay for it right now. Gonna have a quick go of Cave Story just to show you what that's like, and then we'll wrap up this video. In the next video, I will show you how to add more systems to it with more ROMs so you can have more fun. I, uh, would you believe I've never actually played Cave Story before? Never, never. <laughs> uh, one, I guess? No? Uh, a, there we go. Text based adventure. From somewhere, a transmission. get past all this blah -de blah -de blah you get the idea with the retro pie you can play retro games let's see what uh okay what buttons do i have available here whoa okay i've accidentally hit fast forward or something how did i do that i don't know <laughs> oh man yeah, I can look up, but that's about all I can do. <laughs> I don't know either. <laughs> I've just found out the hard way that the method that we've used in this video will mean that the full file size of your SD card will not be available to you straight away. So I'm going to show you a very, very simple way that requires little to no Linux knowledge. I know I keep saying that, but I promise you it doesn't. A way of expanding the file system so that it covers your entire SD card. So. When you're in this menu and you're scrolling through the different games that you have available to you on your keyboard, hold down Alt and F4 and you will be presented with Linux command line or shell as you know it's actually called. Now I'm going to zoom in here just a little bit so that you can see the command that I'm just about to type. The command that you want to type sudo or spi hyphen config. Press enter and you will be presented with the following screen with the following options. The first option is pretty much the one that you want. It says expand file system. It ensures that all of the SD card storage is available to the operating system. You want to hit enter on that. It will do its thing and the boot partition has been resized. 
that is pretty much all you need to know. You can press escape then, and in order to get back into the menu that you will be used to seeing, simply type emulation station, all one word, press enter. I hope that's not too complicated. It is something that you will want to do in order to have the full size of the SD card available to you. Uh, otherwise, there will be hardly any space, a couple of hundred megs or two of space available for ROMs, which is not ideal. Also, after resizing the SD card, another thing that you may want to do, depending on your preferences really, are to update the operating system, first of all. So you're going to hit Alt F4, and you're going to be brought back to this login screen. The command is sudo apt hyphen get update. The command that we've just done has basically told the Raspberry Pi where to get the updates, and now we actually want to update the main operating system that runs behind RetroPie, which is called Raspbian. So to actually start the upgrade of the main operating system, you're going to again type in sudo apt hyphen get and this time you're going to type in the word upgrade you hit enter that's going to do its thing it's going to ask for your permission basically to update what it wants to update you just hit y and let it do its thing that is going to take a little while i'm not going to bore you with the entire process i did promise you no linux knowledge required whatsoever in fact the only hint of linux that you really have is when you turn the unit on and you see the little bit of uh, boot up text before it actually shows you the main RetroPie menu. In the next video, we're gonna go over a couple of more things. We're gonna show you how to connect up and configure some game controllers, i.e. the Xbox 360 game controller and the PlayStation 3 controller. Um, in the next video, we'll also show you how to add more systems to the unit and to get some of your ROMs on there. It might sound daunting, but I promise you it's not. Guys, if you've enjoyed this video, or more importantly, if you've learned anything from this video, please click the like button, or click subscribe, just up there, that would be very much appreciated. Uh, there will be more videos like this on the way soon. Now, I wonder how I add games onto the Raspberry Pi? If you want to learn how to play Sonic 1 Mega Drive on your Raspberry Pi properly, tune in for the next video. Don't do what I just did. Play us out, TARDIS USA!